morning. It's snowing outside, in case you didn't know. And here we are at Grace Bible Church, distant and joint heirs, distant on this wonderful February 14th, our snow day, but it's also, as most of you know, Valentine's Day. Now, Valentine's Day usually is made up of uh, chocolate and bunnies, not bunnies, I guess, chocolate and valentines and hearts and all that. But it actually goes back a number of years to the early Roman Empire. And uh, in fact, what happened was the Roman Empire was having to fight the uh, Goths. And so uh, a lot of people got sick from a smallpox plague. And so the Roman emperor decided that he needed more men for his army, but he realized that single men did better. So he banned marriage. And along came a guy named St. Valentine, who did secret weddings for Roman uh, soldiers so they could be married. The emperor didn't like that, and so beat him and decapitated him in 269 AD. And then in 496, the pope uh, turned him into a special day called St. Valentine's Day. So that's why we celebrate St. Valentine's Day from a history standpoint. But from a practical standpoint, it's all about chocolate and Valentine's. So welcome to our day. Hopefully you have gotten the outline that's on graceline.net that uh, we'll be looking at this morning. We're going to be continuing our study in the Gospel of John. So let me pray and then we'll start. Father, thank you for this day. It's cold. It's different. And we pray you would give us safety and pray that we would enjoy this day. We pray, Lord, for our country that is in the midst of an incredible seismic shift in terms of its morality, in terms of its leadership, and it's running away from you as quickly as it can. So we pray, Lord, that we as your church would be a faithful witness, that we would be having a faithful presence in the midst of it. And Lord, we pray for our church, Grace Bible Church here in Dallas, that you would guide our leadership as they are in the midst of determining the next pastor. We pray for wisdom. We pray for your provision. And Lord, we pray for us that uh, you would guide us today as we look at your word. Pray that you would be honored. Pray that you would be exalted as we seek to understand your words to us, the truth to us, and that, Lord, we would be able to operate in a way that pleases you. So we pray for your spirit to illuminate scripture this morning and that we would be honoring to you. We pray this in Christ your name. Amen. All right. Well, if you hopefully have your outline, we are <clears throat> in the Gospel of John. And as you know, <clears throat> excuse me, in John, he is talking to us about how to be born again and how to have eternal life. And in John's perspective, that comes down to one word, that is believe. And so he begins and he ends his book all about believing in his name. When you believe in the name of Jesus, you have eternal life. And belief is very, very important throughout John, especially in chapters 1 through 12. That's where the focal point is on believing in his name. And what do you have to believe? You need to understand who Jesus is and what he did. And who he is is the very son of God, and what he did is take away your sin. So the Gospel of John is giving us this picture of the ministry of Jesus, and we are still in the public ministry of Jesus. And we saw his first sign, water into wine, which was meant to get everyone's attention. Uh, got John the Baptist's attention, then get the people's attention, and so we are progressing through this public ministry. One of the things that takes place during these early chapters, these early four chapters, and we're coming up to rounding off the end of that section of four chapters, is that John is helping us realize that Jesus, the Logos, chapter one, Jesus, the Son of God, chapter one, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, chapter one, is superior to Judaism. And so in chapter two, he helped us see that this new wine surpasses anything that Judaism could bring about, especially using the stone jars of purification. Again, later in chapter two, Jesus displaces the temple 
by seeing the anticipation of him being the ultimate temple. Chapter 3, the prophecy of water and spirit coming out of Ezekiel finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And later in chapter 3, we also saw that John the Baptist uh, realizes that, that he needed to be purified and that he must, meaning Jesus, he must increase and John the Baptist must decrease. And this morning we come to chapter 4, and in chapter 4 we're going to see a locational shift and a person shift. We're going to see a shift, and it's going to go outside of the boundaries of Judaism and into Palestinianism or into a different city, uh, into a place where we're going to find a very interesting person. Uh, we'll call her the Samaritan woman. Now, as you recall, John has showed us who Nicodemus is. He's showed us who he is as a man, as an educated man, he's in high class, he's wealthy, he's powerful, and he actually recognizes Jesus. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to see a Samaritan woman. And being a Samaritan, is one knock against her, and a woman, that's another, and she's ignorant, and she's common, she's poor. She comes late in the day as opposed to coming uh, the midday, basically, noon Jewish time. But Nicodemus came at night, and Nicodemus, although he recognized Jesus, this woman, she doesn't know Jesus. We also need to keep in mind what we saw is there's John the Baptist, which is right in between the Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman's story, and uh, he's kind of looked to as the man who actually came into the light, as opposed to Nicodemus at that point. And now this woman we're going to look at, she's coming at high noon, and she's going to see the light, we think. So let's get a um, running start on this. Look at chapter 4 in the Gospel of John. When therefore the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour, or perhaps noon. <clears throat> so <clears throat> they're traveling, and they're <clears throat> trying to go north up to Galilee, and they have to go through this land of Samaria, the Samaritan area. And at that land, they are going to meet uh, an interesting person. And they meet the person at a, different, a very interesting time of day. That woman is there. Nobody else is there. She's there because, well, she's a woman of ill repute. And she can't really go when the other women go. So she goes midday to get water. Now, water, as you know, plays a very important part both in the Old and the New Testament. But in the New Testament, John John's going to pick up this theme of water, living water, eternal springing water, to make a theological point. And so we come uh, in our timetable to the water table, so to speak, and Jesus meets this woman. So in chapter seven, in verse 7, there came a woman. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So he's there getting water. They're off buying food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, the lady's a little bit perplexed by that. She says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw uh, draw with, and the well's very deep. Well, where are you going to get the living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle, of all things, even the cattle. So all of a sudden, Jesus is creating a very interesting um, situation with this woman who's come simply to get some water. This is Jacob's well. It's found in the Old Testament in Genesis 33. 
And uh, yet this lady is what is called a Samaritan. Now Samaritans basically have a very interesting and long history of a city being renamed, calling the area Samaria. And uh, they actually set up a temple at Mount Gerizim. They erected a temple there and yet it was destroyed in 2000 BC. But they did have a temple and they did go and worship there. And in fact, that's gonna become a, an interesting point here in the midst or in the middle of this. So here's this woman uh, in deep contrast to Nicodemus, the righteous religious leader. Here comes this common Samaritan woman and the Mishnah in one of its uh, tractates that the divisions are called have a comment about Samaritan women. The daughters of the Samaritans are menstruates from their cradle and therefore perpetually in a state of ceremonial uncleanness. So the rabbis would comment about these people, the Samaritans, who were half-breeds, who were traitors, who stayed in the land and married, inter, had an intermarriage situation, so the Jews hated them. And here's this woman who comes from them, and so she's looked upon in a very negative way. But Jesus doesn't uh, worry about that, because he's there to talk about living water, although she's there to get a cup of water, or a bucket of water, he's there to talk about something else. And here's a beautiful example of how Jesus takes something in the normal natural world and builds a bridge to the supernatural world. She's looking for water. He's talking about living water. Now, verse 13 kind of helps clarify this a little bit. Verses 13 through 15, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water, the water in the meeting get bucket, shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Notice Jesus doesn't say him or her. He doesn't say her. He says him. That's part of the culture of the day. But here's Jesus talking about this living water, not the stuff that I could pull up with a bucket, even though he didn't have a bucket, but the living water. And of course, water has a very interesting and rich um, metaphoric place in the Old Testament, if not a literal place in the Old Testament. In fact, turn, if you would, to Zechariah uh, chapter 14. In Zechariah 14, let me read to us verses 6 through 9. This is talking about a future day when Messiah will come and rule and reign, and it will come about in that day that there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle, for it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day or night, but it will come about that at, every, that at evening time there will be light. And it will come about in that day that the living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the Eastern Sea and the other half toward the Western Sea, and it will be in summer as well as in winter all the time. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name, the only one. So in Zechariah 14, we're looking forward to a millennial kingdom. We're looking forward to a kingdom day. And part of that has to do with light. And part of that has to do with water. And part of that has to do with Jerusalem and worshiping the king in Jerusalem with living water going out of the east and going out of the west. So the idea of water and living water, I imagine, resonated with both Jew and Samaritan. And so Jesus speaks to her about that. And this lady obviously is kind of perplexed, I would imagine. But then all of a sudden it twists to a moral situation, so to speak, a, a moral issue. In verse 16, she said, you know, you don't, you know, have anything to draw this water. He says to her in verse 16, go call your husband and come here. That, that's a very sharp twist. That's a very sharp turn, seems to me. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said, well, you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Now, this is a very strange turn of events. Jesus is at the well. He's sharing 
the gospel in a sense. He's talking about how she can have the gift of a living water. And all of a sudden he brings up this moral flaw, shall we say. He asks her to bring her husband, of which she doesn't have one. And Jesus says, you're right, you've had five. Here's a lady who's kind of a failure in relationship. She's a moral outcast. Now, why does Jesus do this? Well, perhaps one reason is to help her become painfully aware of her need. Larry Moyer of a group he started called Evantel, which is a very, very, very good evangelism training group, he used to say, and I had him once as a teacher and, and I've seen him and known him a number of years now, he says, you got to get people lost before you get them saved. Now think about that. You got to get people lost before you get them saved. They, they need to know what the Savior and who the Savior is, but they need to know why they need him. This lady needed to know. And so one way of doing this, and this is kind of the Vantel style of doing this, it's the good news and the bad news. The bad news is, is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The bad news gets worse. The wages of sin is death, according to Romans. But then you need to turn it and say, but here's the good news. Christ died for your sin. Romans 3. And here's more good news. When you believe, you can have eternal life. And whether that's Romans 4 or whether that's Ephesians 2 or whether that's John 4, the woman at the well. Now, I think a second reason that Jesus talked to this lady in such a very graphic way, and, and we only have this part of the conversation. There may have been more. We don't know, but we have what we have and we know what we have. So why does he do this? Well, one, he wants to get her lost, so she realizes she needs to be saved, and so he's helped do that through her moral failure. But I think it's something else as well. I think Jesus wanted this lady to know that he knew. You see, sometimes we might think, you know, if the Lord knew everything about me, he really wouldn't offer me the gift of eternal life. I mean, I'm a wretch. I'm a mess. And if he knew that, well, then he probably wouldn't offer that gift to me because I'm a, uh, look at me. I'm the woman at the well. I'm a nobody. I'm a failure. I'm a cast, outcast. And Jesus says, lady, I know everything about you. And I'm offering you the gift of eternal life. Lady, I know you're a total failure. You're morally reprehensible. Your people hate you. Everybody hates you. But guess what? I am here to offer you a free gift. It's a gift of living water. Your people know about it from the Old Testament, and I'm the one who's incarnating it to you. And he's going to get to that point here in a minute. But this is what John 3.16 is all about. God so loved the world. He, he loved the world, but he understands the world. He understands the role and the place of the woman at the well. He understood the woman caught in adultery later in the Gospel of John. He, under, he knows. He knows all about her. He knows all about me and you and the people you're going to run into. And we get the privilege of saying, sir, madam, he knows everything about you. You don't need to hide it. And he still offers you the gift of eternal life. That's quite an exciting opportunity we have that we get to present to sinners the Savior. And that is what Jesus is doing. He's helping this lady recognize she is the sinner. And now he's going to help her understand who he is because she doesn't quite get it yet. She doesn't quite understand who is this guy. And that's the Christological question or issue. We got the moral problem, the moral issue. Well, now we have the Christological issue in place in verse 19. So the woman said to him, what the heck? That's kind of a loose translation. No, no, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Now, she doesn't know what to do. Jesus has just said, you are a moral failure. You are just a total adulteress. You are a wreck. And she doesn't know how to handle that one. So she kind of backs up and does a little cover and says, well, well, sir, uh, I, you must be a prophet. How do you know all things? In fact, she's going to recognize the fact that he knows all things here in a minute when she goes and shares with the others of the city. 
But notice what she tries to do now, tries to kind of get a little bit away from the issue. Verse 20, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, not Gerizim. And there was a temple there, not right then at that moment, because it would have been torn down about 200 BC. But, but we worshiped at this temple. We worshiped on this mountain. And you people say, you the Jews, you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship, right? At the temple in Jerusalem that uh, was built by Solomon. I mean, that's the one where we should go worship. So Jesus responds to her and says, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. Notice the key word there, believe, because that's what this lady had to do. We're set up for that in 112. We're set up for that in 2 and 3. So we get all that. So this, you need to believe, lady. Listen, there's coming a different time, but an hour is coming, verse 23. And now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. You don't need a temple. You don't need a mountain. You don't need a city. You don't need that historical connection to Jacob's well given through Joseph. No, no. The Father is seeking those who will worship in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Why would that be? Because look at the next verse. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we have a little indication about exactly who is God. Well, God is not a human being, so to speak. God is not found in an idol. God is not found in an icon on a temple or on a mountain. He, male pronoun, he is a spirit. He is spiritual, spirit being. That is why he can be omnipotent. That's why he can be omnipresent. That's why he can be omniscient. That's why he can be fully, totally holy, because he is spirit. One essence, three persons, the Godhead, who is spirit. And so Jesus wants to explain to her about worship. It's not about a temple or a mountain. It's, it's, it's all about the spirit of the living God. And he looks for worshipers who understand that and connect and operate from their spirit to him. Now, that sounds a little metaphysical. It is. That sounds a little mystical. Of course it is. We're dealing with a unique being, a being who is pure spirit and perfect holy spirit. And our spirit is connected with him. This is not Star Wars. This is not the force be with you. This is Christian theology. And we dare not be taken down the wrong road of Satan's cultic, improper, wrong, counterfeit theology. That is why we need biblical theology. So here's a lady who's coming to grips with her own morality, but coming to grips with her own understanding of deity. And so Jesus is commenting on the father. And then the woman, verse 25, said to him, well, I know that Messiah is coming. Ah, she, know, she knows that from her Old Testament. She knows that, but she, does, she knows what is going to happen but she doesn't know who it is. So I know Messiah is coming. He was called Christ, right? Messiah is a Hebrew term and translated into the Greek word Christ, the anointed one. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Now she's looking to say, but you know, the moral problem, let's talk about theology. Let's talk about God. And Jesus corrects her understanding about God. He's spirit. And let's talk about worship. But now you need to understand exactly who it is, who it is who's giving you this gift, who it is who's giving you this opportunity, this living water. Who is it? Well, I understand he's going to come, that Messiah, and tell us all things. And Jesus says to her, I who speak to you, I am. He's not there. I am. And with that, he is declaring himself to be none other than the eternal son of God, the great I am. And throughout this book, we're going to see a number of I am's that are being offered to identify who Jesus is. So this lady had two problems. Number one, she had a moral problem. 
And number two, she had a worshiping problem. And her moral problem, she needed to understand that she has the problem and she needed to know how to solve it. And she had a, a theology problem because she didn't know who Messiah was. And now she knows because Jesus says, I am the very one you're looking for. And that's the one who's giving to you the living water, the gift of living water. John wrote about this in other places. Turn over to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. Here we're at the end of history. In John, we're at the beginning of the Messiah coming. Here we're at the end of it all in the New Jerusalem. Verse 6 is kind of the summary. Well, we'll start in verse 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Verse 6, And he said to me, It's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Here is the free gift of living water. At the very end of all of scripture, the summation of everything in the new Jerusalem, here's your theology that you have to understand. Jesus offers the gift of living water. And that's what brings eternal life. Look at chapter 22, verse 17. Now we're at the end. Verse 17, and the spirit of the bride says, come, and let the one who has ears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. He says, come and take the water of life. This is similar to look and live right? John 3, 15. Look and live. If you believe, you have eternal life. As Moses brought up the serpent, so I'll be lifted up. You look at me and you will live. Folks, this, this is the grace of God. This is God's gift to us. It's Jesus who is the one who is what? Full of grace and truth. It's Jesus who offers grace upon grace, John 1, 16. It's Jesus who's the one who speaks the truth in love, both to Nicodemus and to the Samaritan woman. They needed to understand who he was. They needed to understand what, they had, what he had for them. They could be born again, and they could have the gift of eternal life through the living water. So this is what grace is. The grace of God has been granted from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane to all of us. Started in the Garden, when they rebelled, God's grace provided. The Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is the grace provided. To the very end of all of history in Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, verse 17. It's a gracious, free gift. We talk a lot about grace. So what is grace? to rejoice, to have joy, to give joy, to show favor, to have favor, acceptance, kindness granted, a kindness desired, a benefit, an expression of thanks, grace, gratitude, unmerited favor, and that's more from our theological perspective, a favor done without expectation of return, the free gift of God. Lewis Berry Chafer, the founder of Dallas Seminary, Put it this way, he said, pure grace is neither treating a person as he deserves, think of the woman at the well, nor treating a person better than he deserves, Nicodemus, but treating a person without the slightest reference to what he deserves. Oh, thank God that's true. The woman at the well deserved death. By Jewish law, by moral principle, that's what she deserved. And yet grace says, lady, I know everything about you. 
and I offer to you the gift of eternal life because the offer is not tied to you being good enough. It's tied to me being perfect and loving because God so loved the world. Schaefer puts it this way, grace, as used in the Bible in relation to divine salvation, represents the uncompromised, unrestricted, unrecompensed and loving favor of God towards fill in the blank sinners. It is an unearned blessing. It is a gratuity. God saves sinners by grace. God keeps through grace those who are saved. Those who are saved, God teaches in grace how they should live and how they may live to his eternal glory. So, questions in the quest of the Christian life. Number one, do you understand the grace of God? Grace declares the inexhaustible greatness and inestimable benevolence of our great and glorious God, who is perfect spirit and who knows everything about me and you and the next person you're going to run into. And you get to offer to them this grace. And of course, human helplessness and depravity provide the perfect backdrop for God's grace to shine. So it's unmerited favor, it's undeserved blessing, it's unearned beneficence, it's unwarranted love. What does that look like? Well, page three of your outline puts it well because it's the Apostle Paul. In Ephesians 2, he says, but God being, now notice these words, rich in what? Mercy. Because of his, what? Great love in which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, the woman at the well needed to know that, made us alive together with Christ, living water. And let's make sure you understand where that came from. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's our new identity. For what purpose? In order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. By grace you've been saved through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. It is. It is the free gift of living water. It is the gift of God. Now, that's the message. That's what we bring to a lost and dying world. That's what we bring to our country that is lost and dying. It is exchanged a platform of moral law, justice, and righteous behavior for something far less. And we will see this worked out as the days go by. However, the darker it gets, the brighter we are. The darker the backdrop, the greater the gift of grace. The more perversion that comes about in our country because of the agenda that our whole government now seeks to desire. Total perversion. Romans 1, plain and simple mandated through our government, we get to shine as lights that say, no, no, God created Adam and Eve. He did not create transgender. God created man as male and female. He did not create homosexual and lesbianism. God created it this way and desires this way. And when you go the wrong way, you will suffer because God will give you over to your depravity. And yet in the midst of that, we, in the midst of the judgment upon our country, because of our wicked evilness, God has said, you, my friends, the church, you're the light. You're the light that stands in the darkness. You're the salt that gives savoriness to it. You're the ones who are the pillar of truth, Paul says, in a culture that's falling apart. So what do we do? Well, we point them in the right direction. We point them to the object. The object is Jesus. John the Baptist did. He said, behold, the Lamb of God, he takes away the sin of the world. The action required, 
Real simple. Jesus said, look and live. John 3.15, just as Moses, look and live. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. If they look to me, they will live. Because if they do, then the consequences of that is eternal life. One drop of water, one free drop of water. This water will bubble up into life eternal. And all you have to do is look and you'll live. Drink and you will live. Eat and you will live. This is how John paints the concept of deliverance and salvation. So can you speak the truth of God to people? Can you present the bad news? Got to get them lost before you get them saved. And then the good news and keep the good news clear. It's not about them. It's about the grace of our glorious God who offers to them the gift of eternal life. Marty Colley summarized it this way. He said, he who was infinite suffered finitely so that we who are finite might not suffer infinitely. There's a lot of theology in that. Jesus being infinite took on human flesh, Philippians 2, and suffered and died so that we who were tainted by the curse might not suffer in all eternity. But instead, we can have the gift of eternal life. So are you ready to meet some people at the well? Are you able to turn a natural discussion into a supernatural discussion? Can they talk about water? Can you talk about living water? Can they talk about meaningfulness in life? And can you show them ultimate meaningfulness in life? Can you take their frightened state and their worry and their lack of peace and help them see where there's true peace? Can you take their eyes off of themselves and, and maybe something else they're worshiping and say, this is true worship? Are you able to do that? That means you have to be not only an evangelist, but an apologist and a theologian all at the same time. You say, well, I'm not very good at that. Well, then get better and learn. Because our role as the church, according to the Great Commission, or according to Paul's Great Commission in Colossians 1.28, that I might present every man complete in Christ, we need to help bring the message that will help them become complete in Christ. And that is the grace of God. It is unconditional, it is unmerited, and it is unending. And we get to present that to people who need it. And we're living in a culture now that's very interesting because now people think more than ever they don't need God because they have themselves and or the government. But that simply shows us that this is when they need God the most. Because when they come to the end of themselves, they will have nothing. And so we're living in a world where we need to look at these people and we need to figure out how do I reach them? How do I reach some of these good, bad and ugly people? that were, by the way, just like us. So sometimes we um, back away from evangelism and we don't like some of the people that we might meet. We don't know what to do with them. So guess who's coming to dinner? I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door, not by the beauty of it all, by the lights of its decor, but it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp, the thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, the trash. There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything nice. And Uncle Bill, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus. What's the deal? I'd love to hear your take. How'd all these sinners get up here? God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet? so somber. Give me a clue. Hush, child, he said. They're all in shock. No one ever thought they'd see you. Well, you know what? No one ever thought they'd see you or me or anybody because God didn't get any good deals when he got us. I mentioned in a 
thing I write every Friday, a Friday with Fred this week, that uh, this week a friend of mine who actually led me to Jesus Christ died relatively young, my age. We were in high school together. This guy was known as the preacher, and he would go out and he'd preach in high school with the 20-pound Bible and the double snaps, and he was obnoxious, but he was bringing the gift of eternal life. He was talking about the water of life, and he really didn't care what everybody thought. And one day, through his teaching, preaching, talking, patience, God reached me. And we all have a story of how God reaches us. And sometimes he uses another person. Sometimes he uses another situation. But most of the time, it's done through his word, with his word, and with his people. So my hope for myself and for you, my encouragement for us, is as we're living in a world where we're going to see a lot of women at the well. We're going to see a lot of confused people like Nicodemus. We're going to see a lot of good people like Nicodemus who are lost. We're going to see a lot of bad people like the woman at the well who are lost. And both of them need to understand that they're dead in their trespasses and sin, and they need to be born again. And there's only one way for that to happen. It's through the gift of eternal life. It's the water of eternal life. It is the gift of God's grace through his son. And folks, we get to be the conduit. We get to be the one who brings and says, here the scripture says that I am that one. That's Jesus. And all you need to do is believe that he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And he offers you the gift of eternal life. You got to get them lost before you get them saved. They got to see who he is before they can believe in him. And when we do that, we get to enter in on what the church has been doing for 2,000 years, bringing the truth of the gospel to people who are lost and dying. And we're living in a world that's definitely there. So my prayer for you is to say, do you know how to share the gospel? If you need a Bible track, we have them at our church, or you can go order them online through Evantel. They're all over the place. There are many good ones out there. But maybe you need that, and if you do, that's fine. And then say, Lord, I'm ready. I know the gospel. I've got the track to help me bring people into my life that I might share it with them. So let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you for your word. It's true. And thank you for the stories and the pictures we see. They're true. They happen in time, space, reality. And we see through your love for Nicodemus, and we see through your love for the woman at the well, we see how you reach out, and you don't soft sell it. You don't pretend that there's not a problem. You help get us lost so that you can get us saved. So, Lord, we pray that you would continue that process that you started at the very beginning with Peter, continued through Paul, continued through all of the church. So, Lord, for this, this 21st century, we're here. We're here in America, in a country that's turned their back on you, that used to know you to a large degree and now doesn't want to know you in any way. Lord, it's black, and you give us the opportunity to be the light. So, Father, help us take that opportunity this week. Help us, Lord, be available and faithful. We pray this in Jesus, your name. Amen. Have a good snow day.